Goddess Kring Radio. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Hey, welcome to the Goddess Kring Shannon Kringen podcast. This is number, is it number 15? Wow, I've been doing this for 15 weeks now. For those of you who know who I am, I had a public access TV show on every week for 15 years. So this for 28 minutes every week, this is my radio show, my podcast. And so week number 15, welcome. Thanks to anybody who is listening. I don't know how much of an audience I actually have, but I enjoy recording these. So if you like this, please spread the word. It is now January 26th, 2017. So I will say that I am a huge Bernie Sanders fan. And so basically that pretty much means that the current administration is not really a group of people that I'm a fan of. And I have been actually feeling very angry and very scared along with many other people in this country right now. Um... I will say that on the day of the march, I did not march because I thought I was going to model for medical students and then there was a mix up and actually they wanted us to come the day after, but instead I went and hung out in nature because I felt a pull towards internalness. So while most people marched, including even my mother, who doesn't generally, um, she's more of a spiritual person, she even marched in her small community on Whidbey Island, and apparently 1,200 people marched in Langley on Whidbey Island, which is amazing. I think the population of Langley is only about 1,000 people, so more people than in the population actually marched. And in Seattle, we had anywhere between 130 to 170,000 people, depending on who you ask. I'm not sure how they figure that out. But that pretty much proves that there's a huge amount of people in the United States, as well as many, many, many other cities and countries throughout the world who marched. Millions of people marched. To me, what I liked about seeing the pictures of the march was that it seemed to be emphasizing what we're marching for and not really emphasizing what we're marching against, although part of that goes hand in hand. If you're for women's rights and equal rights and economic justice, you're pretty much against taking rights away and being unethical and giving tax breaks to the millionaires while the rest of us suffer is really not something I'm a fan of. So I'm a huge Bernie Sanders fan. I'm a huge fan of single payer health care, nonprofit health care. So Uh, I was glad to see that many people marching and I was going to run around and take photos. If I had been on my bicycle, I probably would have ridden my bike down there and taken some cool photos and done some photojournalism, if not actually march with everyone else. But instead I went within and I just hung out in nature and I, I actually did a volunteer shift somewhere in nature where I volunteer every couple weeks. Uh, I do 72 hours a year at this certain place where I volunteer. And so I did that instead. And I felt kind of peaceful about doing that, about making that choice spontaneously while most other people I knew were marching for the rights of equality. To me, it wasn't just for women. That march was about uh, marching for equal rights for anyone who feels like a minority, like women or people that are not white males, basically, in the United States, at least. So let me just say that it's easy to get caught up in anger. Was it John Lennon or George Carlin, the comedian, who said, fighting for peace is like fucking for virginity? I think it was George Carlin, actually, who said that, but some people say it was John Lennon. Meaning, there's part of me that wants to go beyond the duality of fighting against us versus them. You know, man versus woman, or conservative people versus liberal people. There's this us and them mentality, the cops and the police versus the civilians. You know, when two countries go to war, there's the Israelis and the Palestinians. There's the bad guys and the good guys. And whoever you think is the good guy changes versus who you think is the bad guy, depending on who you ask, us versus them. So there's the beyond the duality. And I kind of feel like sometimes we need chemotherapy 
And sometimes we need a mega dose of vitamin C. Meaning sometimes if we fight against what we hate and what we don't believe in, it just fights back and it gets worse. In fact, maybe we're going to be more oppressed if we fight. But I'm not saying that we shouldn't fight for what we believe in. But what I'm saying is if the emphasis is on fighting against what you hate, that I think can be dangerous to some extent. Not that we should bow down in fear and be quiet and passive. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's good to stand up for what you believe in, but perhaps the emphasis should be on what we want to see, not what we don't want to see. I think Mother Teresa said that she would march for peace but she didn't want to march against war because she believed in marching for something. She wanted to put her energy into marching for something and she did not want to put her energy into fighting against something that she did not believe in. So I think maybe she thought it would give more power to to war and she would rather give her power to peace. So I'm thinking that for myself, I'm wondering what I should do to be of use to the world and to myself. Because I'm very upset, I consider Donald Trump an economic terrorist. I consider people who like his ideas in terms of economics, economic terrorists, meaning his ideas to give more jobs to Americans sounds good, make America great again. But my fear is what that really means is if we kick out all the illegal immigrants and then we try to give more jobs to actual American citizens who were born here and grew up here, a lot of illegal immigrants are willing to work for low wages because they're desperate for a job and in their own home country, perhaps they don't get paid very much. So my fear is that Donald Trump will lower the minimum wage. It's only seven something an hour right now and lower it to only $5 an hour and say, hey, Americans, come and work for five bucks an hour. It's better than nothing. You're lucky to have a job. You know, that kind of thing, like make America great again might mean make America not have any unions because he is anti-labor union. And he and I don't know what he wants to replace the health care thing with, but I love my Obamacare. My affordable health care is that I am low income. So for me, it's very affordable to go to the doctor. I basically don't have to pay anything because I'm low income and I would happily pay a little bit per month if that's what I needed to do. I know some people that only pay $100 a month because they're low income. But I also know somebody else who said she pays $700 a month, which is not affordable. So it's clearly not affordable to all people. But I will say that I love my health care right now. And I am very, very grateful. And I have a Section 8 voucher because I'm low income. And I'm very, very grateful for that. So for me, these are the things that I believe in that work for me. But I will say that my fear is that with what the Donald Trump administration is doing, signing all these executive orders. My fear is that what they want to do is cut the budgets of any social programs or any programs that protect the environment or anything to do with the arts or anything to do with women's reproductive health in terms of abortion and contraception. And then they want to increase the budget for war, increase the budgets for corporations and tax breaks. And so it just seems to me that their values and their ethics are the opposite of what my values and my ethics like I'm anti gun, I'm pro gun control, I'm pro choice. I am pro putting money into high speed trains and solar panels and infrastructure in the United States. And I'm for nonprofit single payer health care. Even with my health insurance, I have Apple care here in Washington State. I called them up recently to make an appointment with a doctor and they referred to me as a customer, which I suppose that I am, but just being referred to, I'm a patient. I'm a, a, a an American citizen who is a patient for doctors to examine and to receive health care from. And so I consider that a public service, health care and medicine. So I don't consider myself a customer. And it, it's strange that in the United States of America, we consider p- 
patients as customers. That's strange. I don't think doctors and nurses think of me as a patient when they see me. But when you call up your health insurance company, 1-800, you're not, you know, your health insurance, whatever it's called, they referred to me as a customer when they put me on hold. It was very, very strange. So I, I just don't relate to that. So that's what I'm saying. But I don't really have time to concentrate on my podcast this week. I was going to be honest and say I'm actually going to Santa Barbara, California this weekend. And my friend is house sitting for me. And my cat continues to thrive and do well on raw meat diet. I feed him about three or four different brands. And at first I thought it was a lot more expensive than his regular canned and dry food. I was feeding him natural grain free, but then I found out it had rice and potato starch in it, which is almost as bad as wheat. So I stopped feeding him all of that, and this was like weeks ago, and he's continuing to thrive. He's running around and playing. All of his health uh, problems went away so far, and I'm monitoring him every day to make sure, but his digestion, his pee, his poop is all much healthier than it used to be, and I feed him venison, rabbit, lamb, uh, beef, chicken, turkey, sardines, all those different kinds of meats. I rotate them through and I try to get the kind that's frozen and freeze dried that's considered nutritionally balanced for cats, uh, approved of by the National Vet Association. I don't know what they're called, but there's some kind of special veterinary association that puts a seal of approval on certain cat foods. And I mostly feed them only foods that say that so they're nutritionally balanced for all life stages of your cat. I also feed him a couple different kinds of food that are mostly just meat that's ground up with organ meat as well as regular meat and bones and that's what cats need. So I'm just sharing with you and then I was thinking you know it's important in this day and age I feel like the media is very sensationalistic and it's spreading around a lot of gossip and it's exaggerating. Even when it, it, it reports things that are true, I feel like a lot of news headlines are designed to stress us out and scare us. They're just trying to get good ratings and create drama and excitement and entertain people, I suppose. Or maybe the more cynical part of me realizes they're actually trying to spread fear and trying to scare us. I feel kind of manipulated. I don't have a television, but I do have the internet. So I see a lot of news headlines. Even if I try to avoid them, they pop up on my screen. And I try not to take them too seriously or get too stressed out when I read about all the strange executive orders that the Trump administration or that Mr. Donald himself is signing and trying to get passed. I will say that all the more reason to figure out what you really believe in and who you admire. Who do you admire? I admire Temple Grandin and Bernie Sanders, among others. Temple Grandin is the autistic woman who is an expert on animal behavior, and she's also an expert on what it's like to be autistic. And I saw her speak live, and she talks about the importance of when somebody is autistic. You could also apply this to anybody that has any particular problem or deficit or learning disability or handicap or something that just makes them different is to emphasize what their gifts are. Try to find out if somebody has, because most people do have at least one gift. Try to focus on that and build up on the person's gift instead of fixating on what's wrong with them or what they can't do. Like she said, if an autistic person can't tie their shoes, then get them Velcro shoes and just stop worrying about the fact that they're never going to be able to tie their own shoelace. Who cares if they can do math or science or art or music or dance help them cultivate their talent help them cultivate their skills if they're a great computer programmer they're very nerdy and good at math help them focus on that and don't worry about what somebody's not good at so I think that's very good advice for most human beings and I was thinking about that sometimes when somebody has cancer the emphasis is on chemotherapy and radiation and surgery to kill and get rid of the bad cancer cells. The problem is you also destroy some of the good tissue along with the bad tissue. And then there's other people who approach cancer in terms of giving somebody mega doses of vitamins and do coffee enemas and juicing and nutritional things that would strengthen your immune system. And then there are a third group of people who do all three, who do alternative nutritional therapies as well as surgery radiation and chemo 
So I would say that there are three different options there for treating cancer. Well, I'm using that as a metaphor. I'm using the cancer treatment as a metaphor for how do we deal with, if, if, if you like the current administration, hey, that's great, congratulations, I'm glad you're excited about what's happening. I personally am not a fan of the current Trump administration. And I'm very scared about what they're going to do and what they're going to get away with doing, maybe if they can get away with it. So in terms of cutting social services and increasing the military budget, which is already too large in my opinion, and also not helping veterans. I believe that veterans should get the best health care. I think all of us should get health care, but especially if a ve- if somebody is... Um, a veteran of a war and have post-traumatic stress disorder or any kind of physical handicap or any kind of trauma from war, they deserve really, really, really good health care for the rest of their lives. So there it is. So I am not really a huge fan of war and military, but I'm a huge fan of helping veterans heal and recover from their combat experiences. So I am wondering what kind of strategy I should have in terms of surviving the next four years and hopefully thriving. Again, I love my health care. I love my Section 8 rent. I love my landlord. I have a boyfriend. I have a cat. I'm happy that I can feed him raw food and he's thriving. I'm happy that I have the freedom to live the life the way I live. I'm a nude model for a living. I'm happy about all of that. But I'm concerned about what the administration is going to do, the Trump administration specifically. So I am afraid that under Trump, poverty is going to skyrocket. We already have enough homeless uh, people in in the United States of America. Our wages are already low enough. A lot of the Trump administration ideas seem to be about cutting social programs and making it easier for wealthy people and harder for poor and middle class people. And that frightens me. But then I wonder... It's probably a waste of energy. I don't want to go around spewing hatred and anger and fear. You know, I want to focus on what do I believe in? What do I think is ethical? What, you know, I definitely think that it should be illegal for a president to withhold their tax information. I feel like when you're a president of the United States, you are a public servant, supposedly. You are supposed to be serving the public, not just yourself or the wealthy corporate uh, military industrial complex, you're supposed to also be serving the poor, the middle class, the elderly, the masses in America, the USA. Also, international diplomacy is something that I think is important and valuable. And Trump seems to be really kind of gung-ho on being sort of the lone cowboy, John Wayne, American mentality. There's a sort of romantic idea of the lone American who's a rebel and does whatever they want. And screw the rest of the world. And I'm not really into that. I'm not really into the nationalism type of an attitude. I'm more into international cooperation, diplomacy, respecting other cultures, including Cuba, including all countries, whether they're communist, socialist, democratic, capitalist, a mishmash of all of that. In fact, what I really wish there could be would be democratic socialism hybridized with capitalism so that we would have a better infrastructure, better mass transit, better public education, better health care, and we would allow people to go ahead and be capitalists, but wealthy corporations and wealthy individuals should have to pay their fair share of taxes, and we should all benefit from mass transit, public services like health care, public roads, etc., things that we all use as citizens. You know, I have friends that live in different European countries like Norway, Scotland, Canada, England, and there is an attitude in other countries that I've been to, and there's more of a cooperative attitude and more of a civilized, socialized, basic acceptance that basic human rights like health care and mass transit and a place to live and food and shelter is just a basic right as a human. Instead of in the United States where there's a sort of competitive every man for himself type mentality. So let's just say those are some of my beliefs. But I'm trying to figure out how I can deal with the current administration and being upset and scared about it and not wanting to read a lot of news headlines that will stress me out and scare me. Because it's not like these laws are going to be signed, you know, overnight. It's going to take a while before they can put these horrible things in. But let's just see if they can get away with it. But what I'm wondering is, is how much of it should be 
chemotherapy in terms of trying to kill and get rid of the bad things that they're trying to do, how much should we fight against the bad stuff and, and push for it? And how much should we try to build up on the good stuff? You know, stand up for health care rights. But the truth is, some people don't like their health care right now. Some people under Obamacare, it's not affordable for some people. So I agree that it needs to improve. But I also agree that we need to, in other words, stand up for what you believe in. And may, perhaps we do need to fight against some of the bad stuff. But I think it's more empowering to focus on what you want to expand and what you want to grow. So I am just trying to figure this out right now. So this is Shannon Krieg and Goddess Kring. You're listening to my podcast. It is now January 26th, 2017. And I also had an experience the other night coming home on the freeway. I actually accidentally ran into a rat and I killed this rat on the freeway and I cried about it. It was awful. There was nobody else on the freeway and I wish I had slowed down more because I slowed down a little bit and then the poor rat scurried back and forth and hit my car. Me and the rat collided basically and I felt so bad about it and I cried and then I looked up rat medicine because when something, when I have an experience with an animal, whether it's positive or negative, I look up the animal totem because I'm kind of a spiritual Native American-ish thinking person in terms of great spirit. Another thing about religion. Okay, let me just bring this up. Let me just say that I looked up rat symbolism because I accidentally killed a rat on the freeway. And rat symbolizes um, adapting to change, letting go of old clutter and trying new things and being adaptable and being changeable and going with the flow of that. I mean, that's good advice for everyone, really. Being open to change, being adaptable, letting go of old baggage, and also not being so passive. It says, don't be so passive, be more assertive. That's kind of what it was saying. I guess I have a phone call. So I was just going to say that to me, I looked up that and because I honor, I want to honor the life of the poor rat that I accidentally hit with my car on the freeway. And so rest in peace, little rat. Actually, it was kind of a big rat, kind of a big city rat, kind of near I-90 um, near Seattle. Very sad. I wish that hadn't happened, but I cried and I looked up the symbolism and it made me think of Native Americans and it made me think of the wisdom of Native Americans who believe that we should take care of the earth and that Mother Nature... You know, Mother Earth is important, and if we harm the Earth, we harm ourselves because we are connected to nature and we are part of nature. And that's something I also believe in as a naturist and a figure model. I am comfortable with my naked human body and nature itself, plants and animals, and I feed my cat raw food, and that fits right in, and I'm really into nutrition. And I will say that it boggles my mind that people think they have to choose between science or spirituality. I guess that's why I love Native American wisdom, because Native American wisdom is all about taking care of the earth and how that is a sacred and spiritual thing to do. And I don't understand people who think that it's religious or spiritual to not take care of the earth and that we are supposed to dominate the planet. You know, humans dominate this planet. I can hardly stand it. So I just don't really understand that mentality. And to me, that's not a very spiritual way of being. To me, if you believe that, okay, if you're an atheist, I guess it doesn't matter. But if you're an atheist, isn't it just common sense that we should take care of the planet and not chop all the trees down because we want clean oxygen so that we can keep breathing? So we want to just for our own survival, even if you're an atheist and you don't believe anyone created this planet, if you believe we just appeared randomly, all the more reason to take good care of the planet and not pollute the planet and not destroy the planet because we need this to survive. We need this planet Earth to survive. And if you're a spiritual person and you believe that God created the planet, see, I don't think God is a man in the sky. I think that God is consciousness and energy that created the universe. And so I'm not really religious, but I'm very spiritual. And I will say that to me, the most spiritual way of being, the most biggest way of honoring the creator whoever created this this universe or this planet is to take good care of the earth. So I actually don't understand religious people who think it's okay to trash the planet and pollute the planet just to make money. I totally don't understand that. To me, if you really believe that something created this universe that's beyond our human selves, that's like magical and like godlike, 
then it's all the more reason to take good care of the plants and the animals and the water and the ecosystem. All the more reason to let this planet thrive and be healthy and help help this planet survive so that we can all survive on this planet. So I just don't understand people who are not intelligent enough to realize that it's in our own best interest to take care of the planet. I guess some people think that humans can't really mess up the planet. Uh, I think we can. I think if we chop too many trees down and we pollute too much, it's going to go too far and the planet is going to suffer. Although planet Earth would do just fine without human beings. So it could be that we're heading into another ice age and that humans will just be extinct. Who knows what's going to happen. But I believe in taking care of the planet and I wish we could have more solar panels. And I actually have to run to go to a modeling gig now. I've been modeling a lot lately for medical students and art students. And I need to do that. So I'll be back a little later. This is Goddess Kring, Shannon Kring in podcast number 15, January 26, 2017, broadcasting from Seattle, Washington, USA. Thanks for joining me. If you're curious about other things that I do, just go to shannonkringen.com and I'm all over social media, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. I have five different blogs and my own website and Flickr. I have a lot of photographs, thousands of photographs on Flickr. I'm an artist. I'm an improvisational person. So enjoy shannonkringen.com. That's where everything is linked. Or just Google Goddess Kring or Shannon Kringen. S-H-A-N-N-O-N-K-R-I-N-G-E-N. That's a Norwegian name, Kringen. So just Google that and you'll see what I mean. Thanks. Okay, I just got back from modeling for medical students, and uh, thankfully I get paid $30 an hour to do that, although I do have to pay taxes on that. I am a low income. I make about 1500 bucks a month minus taxes, or maybe that's after taxes. I don't remember. All I know is I'm considered low income in this country. I work almost seven days a week because I have a freelance fluctuating schedule. Today I modeled for three and a half hours for an art class, four hours for medical school. I work all seven days this week. Actually, before I'm going to go to California, I worked seven days in a row before that so that I can afford to take four days off and go to California and stay with relatives. I'm going to Santa Barbara. I just took a walk. I wanted to make two points. My name is Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. I think Donald Trump is an economic terrorist because he rips people off. He's a scam artist. He's a con man. And he wants to cut the budgets of all the good things and then lie, cheat, and steal and say that we have to do that because we can't afford to do otherwise, which is a load of crap. But we can increase the budgets for social programs and we can decrease the pay of all the rich, greedy people in the world. So let's just say, let's compare. Okay, I want to make two points. One point is exercise. The best mood stabilizer for me is exercise. If I'm really manic and feeling hypomanic, I exercise and it calms me down and makes me sleepy and slows down my thoughts. If I'm depressed and I exercise, then I get more up and it revs me up. So right now I feel a little revved up because I took some exercise. I just went for like a 30 minute walk. I will say that if you compare two corporations, Walmart and Costco, okay, both of those corporations are fairly successful, I think, and they make a lot of money and they make a good profit. But Costco is a company that I respect and admire. Walmart is a company that I despise and am disgusted by and I've only shopped there a few times and I admit every time I've gone into Walmart I've seen creepy things happen like people getting in arguments, domestic disputes and just people that look stressed out and unhappy and they're just looking for a good deal and buying cheap stuff and the employees that work there look kind of stressed out and you can tell that they're not paid very well and they're stressed out. So let's just compare the two. Walmart, the CEO of Walmart, makes tons and tons and tons of money, and then he lies and cheats and steals and hoards the money and pretends as if his employees should not have unions. They can't afford to give him health care. They can't afford to give him vacations. They just pay him like seven, eight, nine bucks an hour. I don't know how much people in Walmart make, but not much, probably under 10 bucks an hour. And then you got someone like Costco, 
Costco is unionized. The employees in Costco are unionized. The CEO of Costco is not as greedy as Walmart. The CEO of Costco has said that he could be a lot richer if he wanted to, but instead it makes him happy if he knows that his employees, even entry level Costco employees are paid well, like 15, 18, 20 bucks an hour, entry level workers. They have a union, they get vacation time, they get benefits package, they get health insurance, etc. cetera. He, the, the Costco company treats their employees well and pays them well. And there's proof right there. Costco still makes a good profit and they're still a successful corporation and they can afford to pay their employees well, just like they do in most of Europe. Most European countries pay their employees well and you get health care built into your taxes so that your your health care and health insurance has nothing to do with your job. It's a much more simple, streamlined system. And there's no big medical bills. And then if you change jobs, your health insurance doesn't change because you have national health care, which is part of paying taxes as a citizen of a company as of a country. So I wish the United States would do single payer health care separate from people's jobs. And then if you don't like that, you can buy private health insurance. I know in England, there's the NHS, National Health Service. And if someone doesn't like that, they can buy private insurance in England. But private insurance in England is not a ripoff like it is here. A lot of health insurance in the United States is very expensive, even with Obamacare. My health insurance is very, very good because I'm low income and I'm on Apple Care here in Washington State, USA because I qualify for that because I'm low income enough. And I'm not low income because I'm lazy. I'm low income because I work really hard and I don't know how to make tons of money. And to be honest with you, I owe $65,000 in student loans. So if I made more money, then the student loan people would come after me. And if I made more money, then then my rent would go up because I would lose my Section 8 voucher and I have mood swings. I have OCD and cyclothymia and I have a lot of mental challenges that I deal with from day to day. So I feel very defensive. I feel like there's so many Americans who think poor people are lazy and that's such a stereotype and that rich people work really hard. You know what? Some rich people are lazy and they're just born into wealth and they just sit around and fart and drink martinis and they make more money than janitors and school teachers and people that work really hard for like seven, eight, ten bucks an hour. So my fear is that Donald Trump, when he says make America great again, what he means is make America, make, make America slave labor again. I think what he means by that is kick out all the illegal immigrants and then make white Americans work for five bucks an hour. Because we all know that if you're an illegal immigrant here in the United States, you're desperate for work, you're willing to work for low wages. How many Americans want to work for five bucks an hour? Probably not too many. But Donald Trump will probably say, hey, we're getting the factories back in the U.S. and you guys are lucky to make five bucks an hour. We can only afford to pay you five bucks an hour, but hey, at least you can have a full-time job again and you can't have a union and you can't have any benefits because we don't believe in that. That's communism. That's socialism. We are a capitalist free society, which really means... Extreme capitalism is not democracy, it's fascism. Because when you have extreme capitalism where the rich people boss around the poor people and pay you five bucks an hour and don't even give you any benefits and act like you're lucky if you can even take a vacation at all because you got to work really hard and then if you can save any money, you get to take a holiday. Whereas in Europe, people take holidays every year and it's considered normal, a normal, healthy, balanced part of life. Not something you have to work your ass off to deserve to rest. That's a very American idea, being really competitive and think you have to work really, really, really hard in order to earn the right to take a holiday or a vacation. In Europe, it's a totally different attitude. In Europe, it's considered normal and healthy to take rest and have a holiday every year, sometimes two or three times a year. I have friends that live in Europe and I know this for a fact. Also, healthcare is built into your taxes, so you don't have to worry about big medical bills, especially if a woman is giving birth to a child and she has a C-section in Europe. She doesn't get a $30,000 bill like she does here in the United States of America. That's ridiculous. So when Donald Trump says we're going to make America great again, my fear is what he means is he's going to pay people crappy wages. He's going to allow corporations to not have unions. In other words, to deregulate 
and lower minimum federal minimum wage and make it so that people can work for five bucks an hour. And he's going to give tax breaks to the wealthy and then the middle class and low income are screwed and abandoned. When he says we're giving this country back to you, the people, that sounds nice in a certain way. But my fear is that the reality is he's saying we're going to abandon you. We are the rich elite government and we are going to abandon you and we're going to pretend like that's freedom. That's freedom and democracy when the government ignores you and doesn't give you any benefits and cuts all the social programs and then hoards all the money for themselves and gives tax breaks to millionaires and billionaires just like what Bernie Sanders says. All the rich people are going to get all the benefits and all the corporations are going to be rewarded for making tons of money tons of money. And then the poor and the middle class will be abandoned by the government. But according to Donald Trump and the people who like him, that's freedom. The freedom for the government to abandon you. And then you have to fend for yourself. And you have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and work your ass off for low wages. And then hope someday you can get rich. My goal in life is not to be rich. My ultimate goal in life is to be happy and healthy and love myself and take good care of myself and have balance. And do work that I believe in and work that I love. I model for medical students and art students. I've done medical modeling for 20 years. I've done art modeling for 25 years. I work very, very, very hard. I'm in therapy. I've been in therapy for 20 years off and on. I work very hard and I budget what I do and I shop at Costco and Trader Joe's and I try to stock up on things and I find sales and I work hard and I'm feeding my cat raw food and I'm trying really hard and I have a boyfriend which is a miracle in itself so it's just so sad to me to see all these judgmental people acting as if it's a it's a good thing what Donald Trump is gonna do I'm really afraid of what he's gonna do so my, I, I feel very defensive about being a low-income person. I work really hard. I think a lot of low-income actually people work actually pretty hard. They just don't get paid really high wages. Plus, if you have emotional challenges like I do, like OCD and mood swings, and you're in therapy and you think about suicide from time to time, you definitely need to find a way to not have to work seven days a week just to survive. So people do deserve the right to rest from time to time, take holidays and vacations. So thank God I get to go to Santa Barbara this weekend and stay with relatives. And my plan is to eat and sleep and rest and walk on the beach and hang out with my great aunt who's 89 years old and her health is starting to decline. So I'm really, really, really hoping that I can do that and enjoy myself. I'm feeling very defensive right now. I feel sad for all the low income and poor people, the handicapped people, the war veterans, and I'm disgusted and sad that Donald Trump is doing all these executive orders to take the rights away from gay people, from women's reproductive health rights. I had an abortion in 1996, and it was a sad story, but I was in a, an abusive, dysfunctional relationship, and I was afraid to become a mother, and I didn't want to be a bad mother, and I was afraid to quit my job, and I didn't want to be a single mother on welfare and I didn't want to move in with my parents and the guy that I got pregnant with was polyamorous and he didn't he didn't believe in monogamy or marriage or any of that kind of stuff he was a wild and free hippie and he wanted me to have a baby with him and go live on a commune and I was too afraid to do that so I changed my mind and I had an abortion and I thank God that I had the legal right to have an abortion in this country USA in 1996 I had an abortion my name is Shannon Kringen and I had an abortion in 1996. Go ahead and judge me for that if you want. I made the choice that I made and I would never tell a woman that she should or shouldn't have an abortion. It's every single woman's choice. I also met a woman recently who said her grandmother had an abortion in, 19, in the 1930s and the reason why even though her grandmother didn't really believe in abortion, she didn't really want to do that, she had five or six kids already and the doctor told her if you give birth to this baby you will probably bleed to death. You will probably die in childbirth. So do you want to give birth to this fifth or sixth child when you already have several kids that you're taking care of? Do you want to take a chance that you're going to give birth to this child and then die and then someone else will have to raise your kids for you? Or do you want to have an abortion and then just focus on raising your, your five or six kids that you already have? So she opted to have an abortion. So who's going to judge a woman for doing that? And especially if a woman gets raped or a woman is pregnant and she has health issues, mental health issues, physical health issues, she doesn't want to have a child. It doesn't mean that you just casually decide to have an abortion. But then again, I do believe a woman has the right to do that, even if she's doing it for a stupid reason. 
I do believe in the rights and the freedom for us to govern our own bodies. So how dare some white rich men tell us what we can do with our bodies. That's just horrible. And thank God for all the men out there in the world who actually understand and agree with me on this, who are feminists and who agree that women should have the right to choose whether they have an abortion or not. I guess it just scares men that we can have abortions. It makes them feel emasculated. I don't know. Men don't want women to be powerful because they're afraid of losing their power. But we don't have to be so competitive. We can be cooperative. Men and women can be cooperative. So these are some of the things I'm thinking about as I went for my walk tonight. And I need to go to sleep because I have to get up at 6 a.m. And, and do art modeling. So I guess I'll continue this monologue after I get some rest or I might play some of my poetry now for the rest of the show. It's been 40 minutes. I got 20 more minutes to do. So my name is Shannon Kringen. You're listening to the Goddess Kring podcast radio. If you like what I'm, what I'm doing, please spread the word. I put this free on my YouTube with visual art as the slideshows for visuals on my YouTube videos of this podcast. And I put this on Mixcloud and Hollow Earth Radio and Patreon and Bandcamp. So thank you for listening. Uh, my website, shannonkringen.com. I'm an artist. I'm a model. I'm an experimental human being. I have several different blogs. I have Instagram. I have Twitter. I have Facebook. I have Live Journal, WordPress, LinkedIn, Tumblr. Uh, I'm on, what's that other website called? Um, Pinterest. Just Google Shannon Kringen or Goddess Kring and you'll see hundreds of pictures of me. I'm also open to being interviewed. If I can get my shit together, I would like to figure out how to audition for some voice work. I do have a nice voice when I'm calm and I speak in a calm manner. People have said that my voice is soothing. I'm just a little upset right now. I'm a little stressed out. I'm, I'm having a bit of a mood swing. Maybe I'm a little hypomanic. I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm also just upset about the election and people arguing with each other. And I think that it's not good to spread hate, anger, and fear. Uh, but I also think it's good to be honest. So I I think it's good when people can find a way to not be fake and speak what's on their minds, but do it in a way that's not hateful. And, you know, like if I sound hateful and angry right now, I'm sorry. I do feel angry. I do feel scared. I do feel sad. I feel defensive. Uh, but I try to be a positive person and I try to be the change that you want to see. I wonder about that. I think it was John Lennon or George Carlin who said fighting for peace is like fucking for virginity. So part of me believes that you have to do chemotherapy. When something bad is happening, maybe you need to do chemotherapy and radiation, etc. I don't mean literally. I mean figuratively. Maybe when something bad is going on, we need to fight against it and try to kill it and get rid of it and cut it out like cancer, like a tumor. But that's kind of what war is based on, like the war on terror, bombing people. Bombing people doesn't really work because then you end up bombing people who have nothing to do with the conflict and you bomb innocent people and it's collateral damage and that's bad and that's horrible. And then it just spreads more anger and fear about the United States and makes people want to attack us back. So I don't know. I don't think war really works. And Martin Luther King said, that, you know, you can't drive out darkness with more darkness. You know, you can only do that with love. So love is the answer. But then there's people like John Lennon and, and Martin Luther King who get shot and killed because they speak out against violence and therefore then they're killed in a violent way. Just so that people can prove, see, John Lennon was wrong because some jerk with a gun killed him. And Martin Luther King was wrong because some jerk with a gun killed him. So that's really sad. So they're, they're trying to prove that these people are wrong by killing them, I suppose. And that's really, really sad to me. So I still believe in nonviolence. And so I was going to say fighting for peace is like fucking for virginity. I was going to say it's probably better to build up what you do believe in. Like Mother Teresa said that she would not march against war, but she would march for peace. So I'm wondering, how can I take all of this energy I have and apply it? Because I'm upset about the new administration and what they're going to do. Take away our health care, mess things up for us, make things worse, cut all the social programs and increase the war budget and increase benefits to the wealthy and the corporations and then decrease benefits for low income and, and middle class and thus erasing the middle class. I mean, the United States is already becoming more and more full of poverty, you know, because rich people are hoarding the money. 
and our society is structured in a way that greedy people get rewarded and poor and middle class people get the shaft. So let's just say that I'm sad about this and I wish that Bernie Sanders was the president of the United States for about 50 million different reasons. I love Bernie Sanders. I love democratic socialism mixed with capitalism. Extreme capitalism, the way we have it now, becomes its own form of fascism. When everything is based on profit and competition, it's not a good thing. It's too harsh. We need more social programs. We need more social infrastructure. We need more nonprofit public services like public transportation, public schools, public colleges, public health care, etc. The public fire department, the public police department, the public mass transit, all that stuff we all use. Rich, poor, young and old, sick and healthy should all have access to all of that. When I go to Europe, I am amazed at how beautiful their train stations are. They put money into their mass transit. You know, the mass transit in the United States is just so like not good and our train system is a joke we do have some nice trains here and there in different cities in the united states but when you go to europe and you see how beautiful their train stations are and how much public art they have they have beautiful museums beautiful public art beautiful mass transit i mean the governments of europe put more money into that than we do here in this country in this country we have beautiful sports football stadiums hospitals that look like fancy hotels with marble countertops i mean it's absurd I don't care about mar marble countertops in my hospital. I just want good health care. I don't need fancy, schmancy, uh, upscale hotel looking um, hospitals. That's silly. So in the European cities I've been to, like Norway and London, you know, Oslo, Norway and London, England and Liverpool and different places of England and Scotland and, and France and different places I've been, the hospitals aren't as pretty as the ones we have here, but they give their citizens medicine and good medical treatment. So in Canada too. So, so there it is. So I guess I'm just not a huge fan of extreme capitalism. You know, I'm a fan of democracy, but I don't think that extreme capitalism where rich people have all the power and poor people don't have a lot of say in things is a democracy. You know, extreme capitalism becomes its own form of fascism. So when you have a more socialized uh, democracy mixed in with capitalism, that's a healthier society. That's more balance, if you ask me. So that's how I feel about it. So I need to go to bed now and I'm going to continue this monologue tomorrow or I'm going to add some poetry. So thanks for listening to Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. I'm a little upset right now, but I'm going to be fine. I'm going to go to California, hang out with my relatives and calm down. I work really, really hard. I'm so tired of, of low income and poor people being judged for being lazy. I know that I personally am not lazy at all. It doesn't mean there aren't some poor people that are lazy, but that doesn't mean that they should be punished and have to live in you know, hideous suffering conditions just because they're not workaholics. I mean, I do think in this country, if you're a workaholic, you're rewarded for it. I mean, I work sometimes seven days a week and I'm exhausted and I don't really have much of a personal life. And th that is my choice. And that is my problem that I need to fix. But I almost feel like this country, it makes it easy to be a workaholic because people are rewarded for it. And it's like I need to find the balance, more vacation time, more time to rest and relax, take walks, hang out with my cat, just simply relax and enjoy life instead of thinking I have to work and make money, work and make money, work and make money all the time. So that's the dark side of the U.S. is is, is encouraging people to be workaholics and thinking that we're all supposed to want to be rich. I mean, my biggest goal in life is not that I want to be rich. I still want to be famous, but I don't want to be rich. I want to be happy and healthy and have a balanced life. So thanks for listening. ShannonKringen.com is my website. I welcome questions and comments. Thank you. This is podcast number 15. I've been doing this every week for 15 weeks now. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, thanks for listening. Okay, this is Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. You're listening to my podcast, Continued. I recorded this after I just got back from a modeling job and I just fed my cat some raw frozen meat that was venison, which is deer, which brings me to my next point, which is education and Temple Grandin and autism. 
And the fact that I just fed my cat some raw meat and it made me think of, I switched my cat's diet to raw meat and I feed him uh, uh, lamb, venison, turkey, chicken, beef, sardines, and I'm going to try rabbit next. And he seems to love them all. And he is thriving and doing really well. I will say that Temple Grandin is an autistic woman who has this great mind. She is able to go into a slaughterhouse and watch how they slaughter cows and yet not be so upset. She cares about the cows enough to want it to be more ethical the way they slaughter them. And she's smart enough to know that the cattle people mostly just care about making a profit and money, not really about the welfare of their cows, aside from just keeping them alive long enough to slaughter them and keep them healthy enough to be good meat to sell in the market. So Temple Grandin is somebody who's autistic and thankfully watch the movie that's about Temple Grandin starring Claire Danes. It's a great movie. If you've never heard of Temple Grandin, look her up. T-E-M-P-L-E-G-R-A-N-D-I-N, Temple Grandin. She's an amazing human being, has a PhD in animal behavioral science, and she's an expert on being autistic. She's one of the most articulate autistic people uh, living today that I'm aware of. So I relate to her point of people um, who have eccentric minds like autistic people or idiot savants who are very, very, very good at math or science or art or music, and yet maybe they can't even tie their own shoelace, or maybe they're dyslexic, or maybe they have a learning disability, and yet they're very gifted in another way. She's an example, which leads me to my point that I am so blessed and so grateful that when I was a little kid, my mom put me in alternative school for fourth, fifth, and sixth grade a school called Abraxas in San Diego, before we left San Diego, and then a school called Tamanaus on Whidbey Island, uh, when I, and which is, I think Tamanaus is an Indian word, and I forgot what it means. It's a Native American Indian word, and I forgot what it means, something sacred. And Abraxas, I'm not sure what that means, but those are the two sort of hippie, artistic-minded, individualized alternative schools that my mom put me into. And I would say that that really saved me and helped me as difficult as my child was, childhood was because my parents divorced when I was four. We moved around a lot. There was a lot of instability and upheaval and chaos and just various things going on for different reasons. My parents are both very intelligent, sensitive human beings. Uh, I mostly lived with my mom, saw my dad on weekends, but my mom put me in this alternative school. And let's just say that in regular mainstream public school, I was teased and picked on because I was kind of an eccentric little kid. I was a little bit shy. I was kind of introverted. I was kind of, you know, I, I kind of lived in my own dream world and I dressed in a colorful way that I wanted to dress in and, and wasn't really cool in the social way. So I had various traits that made it easy for people to pick on me and make fun of me and tease me. And I felt this pressure to conform and be normal. And I just wanted to be myself, which was a unique human being. And so when my mom put me in alternative school, because she was concerned, she's an artist and very spiritually minded, wanted me to have a good education. So she took me out of public school and put me into alternative schools where we learned about Native American history and we learned by going to the ocean instead of just reading books about the ecosystem and the ocean we went we took field trips and the instructors all the teachers gave us individualized attention and every single student was thought of as a respectable intelligent human being that had their own unique gifts and so I I was kind of a slow reader and I might be a little bit dyslexic and my instructors helped me work with that and they taught us and I got to write a play when I was 11 years old I remember my girlfriend and I um, wrote a play and we performed it and we got to write and direct and cast it and perform it in front of our school and there was music and we learned French and we learned about Native American Indians and we learned about medicinal herbs from Native Americans and we learned about uh, respecting Mother Nature and taking care of the earth and eating healthy and we just learned all kinds of things not just the regular mainstream like nowadays kids take uh, standardized tests and there's not a lot of creativity left in some of the schools so I'm really 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 happy and I think we should keep public education free for all kids um, 
rich and poor and middle class and all different abilities and disabilities and there's and everyone has gifts and so my mother put me in these alternative schools fourth fifth and sixth grade nobody picked on me and there wasn't this competitive idea of trying to conform and be normal there was more of an acceptance of everyone being an individual and every student having their own individual unique gifts and as well as having deficits and that it was okay if you were a slow reader or not good at math the instructors would help you try to try to figure it out if you were bad at something and they would mostly help you figure out what you were good at and try to focus on that and I remember I started writing in a diary because I read the diary of Anne Frank and I was inspired to write in a diary and I've been doing that off and on ever since I was 13 and I'm now 48. So I'm really, really happy and grateful that my mom put me in these alternative schools and that Temple Grandin with her unusual brain as an autistic person, she has a hard time communicating in certain ways. And yet she's able to walk into a slaughterhouse and watch how they slaughter cows. And she was able to redesign. She understands cows and how they behave and why they behave and what scares them and what makes them calm. And so they were able to stop using cattle progs and stop being cruel to these cows to get them to walk to their own slaughter. She designed, because if you're going to slaughter cows, you may as well do it in a more ethical way, is what she has said, is that she cares about the animals and wants it to be done in a more ethical way to cause less fear and stress to the animal. It's not like we're going to be able to stop humans from slaughtering cows. And so if you're going to slaughter cows, at least do it in a more ethical way. And she knew that if she told them they would make more money if they did it her way, then they would go for it. But the truth is it's also better for the cows' mental well-being because they don't panic and freak out the way they used to when they walk down her cattle. I don't know what you call it when cattle's walk to their own slaughter and they don't realize where they're going. She designed something that's curvy and it fits the natural way that cows want to walk in a spiral curve shape. It's very fascinating. So look her up, Temple Grandin. And her message is that for any kid, especially if they're autistic, but this could apply to anyone, that if your kid in school or even an adult, if you have certain deficits and if you're really bad with certain things, bad with math or bad with reading or writing, what are you good at? For, some people learn better auditorily. Some people learn better visually. Some people learn better physically, spatially in a kinesthetic level. So different people have different skills. And she said that you need to recognize if somebody has a talent and try to help them nurture that talent and cope with the deficits. But don't emphasize what's wrong with the person. Emphasize what's good about this person and try to help them cultivate their gifts and their talents so that they don't get hung up on what they're bad at and what they can't do and compare themselves to others. If somebody is really good at math or music or art or theater or dance or being a scientist or whatever, just let them cultivate that and just cope with their deficits as best you can, but emphasize cultivating the gifts. So this kind of inspires me because in this horrible time of having Donald Trump as our president in this United States of America, I'm afraid I, I think of him as an economic terrorist because I don't think I agree with the way he thinks we should spend money in this country, cut all the social programs and increase all the war budgets and tax breaks for rich people. So it's important to think of who do you admire? If you admire Donald Trump, well, that's great, but I don't. I don't admire him. So I admire Temple Grandin, Bernie Sanders. I admire people out there trying to help the planet, trying to get solar panels going. I mean, there's a lot of people to admire on this planet. So I'm wondering, who do you admire and why? So we're on planet Earth together and let's make the best of it. I've been feeling really scared and angry and I'm going to get a memo because I haven't had that in 15 years and I want to make sure everything's okay with my breasts because I had breast reduction surgery in 1993 and I have scar tissue so I want to make sure that there's no tumors hiding underneath my scar tissue in my breast so while I still have my affordable health care hopefully I can keep it I'm going to go get a mammogram and make sure I get myself checked out, make sure I'm as healthy as I can be and keep eating healthy, eating diatomaceous earth, 
being with my cat. So I'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning in to Goddess Kring. Go to shannonkringen.com if you want to see my artwork. I might start interviewing other people about interesting topics. I'm not sure. Or, or have interesting dialogues with other artists or creative people that I know in Seattle. I'm thinking about it. If you want to be interviewed on my show, you can email me, shannonkringen.com. Click on contact. Find my email. Thank you so much. I'll see you next week. Again, check out my website or my YouTube channel, my Instagram, my Flickr. There's just Google Shannon Kringen or Goddess Kring and you'll see a bunch of my artwork. And let's all have more compassion for each other. So if Donald Trump is a narcissist, well, narcissism is a form of insecurity. So maybe we could learn to have more compassion for that. But what his policies might really damage life for a lot of people. So I'm really scared. But have a good week. I'll see you next week. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs> Goddess Kring Radio, Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring, 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 Goddess Kring